You know, it's been a week and I've forgotten how to do all this stuff. Yeah, here we go. All right, so new anthropologies. We're going to get to it, new anthropologies. I want to talk about this. Um, yeah, so anthropology in the human condition, 10th of November, uh, 2021. Lecture number eight this is part one, obviously. New anthropologies. Um, by that, I mean to say we left off before the exam break. Hope you all did well. Um, at the beginning of the reflexive turn and the question of ethics. All right. And uh, the reading for this week was uh, Malcolm Crick's text on uh, a very provocative text on anthropology and anthropologists as tourists. And I want to situate that a little bit. Um, and then get on to talk about participatory anthropology in the weeks to come to talk about workplace inquiry, uh, autonomous anthropology, uh, anarchist anthropology today, largely. Um, and uh, uh, what I have in mind with starting with Crick is that um, Malcolm's prov provocation was intended as a bit of fun, but also sort of uh, pointed barb to prick the conscience of anthropologists who uh, took themselves very seriously, even though they were having this reflexive and ethical crisis, the kind of ethics we talked about two weeks ago, and the reflexivity we talked about three weeks ago in Gledhill's work, you know, uh, that that there had been independence movements and it became more difficult for anthropologists just to waltz into, waltz into uh, colonized countries and start doing anthropology. Um, you know, with, uh, with the, the local power holders being of their own country, the colonial power, um, when it became like they had to ask other people uh, and there are other kinds of anthropologists as well, the, the anthropological movement as a whole seemed to turn inwards and do two things, either think about what it is to do anthropology or to do anthropology at home, right? And we'll talk about that at home stuff uh, later. But one part of it that, that, that I took up especially um, when I was uh, long, long ago, undergrad and then postgrad, and then in my PhD work, which is far too long ago for me to even say when. The book about it is now 25 years old, uh, Rumour of Calcutta. But I followed up Crick's idea, Malcolm Crick's idea, that anthropologists were like tourists. And instead of doing anthropology at home, in a way I did anthropology of the self, um, studying tourists in Calcutta. But Crick's article was a bit more barbed than, than even that. He, he wanted to say that anthropologists take themselves too seriously and that maybe tourists and anthropologists are more alike than anthropologists would want to ever admit. Uh, so let's, let's discuss tourists and anthropologists for a while. Um, the first thing to say is, you know, what's the, what's the biggest uh, thing about um, Tourism and anthropologists that you see that's obviously similar is the production of text. Anthropologists write books about culture and tourists write postcards or letters home or blog posts or and they carry books with them, of course. They reference books, they have reference books, they reference a travel guide especially. I mean, that's the material manifestation of travel. You can't really show people traveling. I mean, you can show people walking, but what's to distinguish? You can't, can't you know, I'll show some images, of course I will, of, of travelers. But um, the, the first thing to think about is, is books, and the, and the biggest book of all for travel uh, is The Lonely Planet. Great title, great name for a title. Um, good logo, right? The book and the logo, the planet, the circle, really clear concept. Lonely planet, tourists all get lonely and they're all over the planet and they, the idea is you bring the planet together into one and these books uh, uh, put the idea of tourism, uh, uh, travel, tourism as, as a, a way of you know, getting to know each other, love for everyone. 
okay but i think that's that's lovely and so on but but the other side of it is it's a it's an economy tony and maureen wheeler started lonely planet they're from my hometown melbourne and uh back in the 70s they were a part of a very typical thing then it was so expensive to to leave uh australia at that time it still is but uh, that if you went, you went for a long time. You went for six months or so. You didn't ever go for a weekend. That was just ridiculous. With wife spends so much money to get out of the country, you, you, you spent the time doing a tour. And a lot of people went to Europe and then got stuck in Europe, had to work in London to get their money back and didn't have much money because Europe's so expensive. They ended up trying to get back over land in the 70s, 60s and 70s. And... Um, Often they went on a shoestring, so to speak. Uh, there's even a travel guide uh, called Asia on a Shoestring or Two Asia on a Shoestring. And there was these buses as well, the Overnight Express, so-called Express, uh, Midnight Express. There's a movie named after it. It went to Turkey, uh, Istanbul. Anyway, um, Maureen and, and Tony kind of cashed in publishing guides uh, for, for backpackers traveling overland cheaply. Um, photocopied, Ronio paper uh, uh, at first and then stapled together. And eventually they produced their first book across Asia on the cheap, right? Traveling from one side of Asia to the other, going to Australia uh, with, with hints and, and uh, addresses and phone numbers of uh, joints that you could go to that were cheap, cheap joint place to stay uh, uh, for, for basically the, the comfort of budget tourists on um, the banana pancake trail, right? Uh, stops all along the way from Australia to, to Egypt, basically, where you can buy banana pancakes. Although in Vietnam, it takes the form of ban chui. Uh, well, you can buy banana pancakes in District 1. But Anyway, Lonely Planet started out in this small budget item. This is their first India book, as I said. Uh, but it, it boomed yeah, to the point where there's not a bookshop in England that doesn't have a bunch of Lonely Planet guides, and they're still there, even survived the, the world of internet. About 30% of their stuff is online now. But uh, Tony and Maureen, of course, sold the company, kept the name and kept the uh, role in the company, but they sold it for $100 million. It got even bigger after that. Um, that's a lot of money for something that was just done for backpacking, right? And and Tony says at one point, I quoted in my book, um, sometimes he angsts about lying back in a five-star hotel in Nairobi writing about budget tourism, whether it is an ethical question. Same kind of question that Malcolm Creek should be getting anthropologists to, to ask. Anyway, um, yeah, Lonely Planet. So let's, let's, I've been talking about photographs and uh, let's have a look at this, this photograph. Uh, no, it's not a photograph. It's a drawing on the front of the first. Nowadays, it's a, it's a photograph on the Lonely Planet guide and it's much more real. But the, the first one, I think, is revealing. If we look a bit more closely, um, what we've got here is, is a lovely mood knit scene uh, in a kind of, What's it called? Lakshmi Lodge. Um, Lakshmi is the goddess of wealth, I suppose. Um, not insignificant. It looks lovely. It's got a portico and, and balustrades, and it's all a bit Eastern exotic. Lovely carpets sit out, and there's some gopis offering this guy tea. All right, one of them's playing the sitar. One's got a doll drum. Um, can't see it close enough. Let's get a close up. Okay, here is the guy himself. Actually, when you look more closely, the facial expressions are. All right, so, okay, let's start with the guy. He's, he's classic, isn't he? Look, wearing a t shirt, Lonely Planet t shirt. Yay. Um, blue jeans. He's got a backpack with him. Um, looks to me like it's got a leopard skin covered sleeping bag and he's got a uh that's the south african flag there so so we assume he's this guy's south african clean cut looking guy and he has uh being offered some 
He's got a, a money belt. Look at his wallet, money belt. That's 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 interesting. Actually, we used to call those the IMF sparring, sparring Scottish kilt type thing. But people put them in the front. Not a good place to keep your money if you're trying to like hide the fact that you're wealthy. It's, it's more like a show off thing. It's a, like if if anyway. By the by, and he's being served tea or coffee, I guess. Um, by this to go look at the facial expressions though his is open and starry eyed but she's like frowning I get the impression she's frowning anyway I haven't to serve him why wouldn't you frown and the other woman behind him is kind of I imagine she's looking at him a bit sadly I don't know what do you think doesn't she look she's like you're pathetic <laughs> he's really into, you know, he's there. The idea is that, that, you know, young boy out in the world after university, whatever, seeing the world and, and, and finding himself, finding out who he is by traveling around uh, on the cheap in, in Asia, meeting new girls and uh, having experiences. This was not an unusual thing uh, and it became a massive industry, but but it, it reaches right back, and travel guides reach right back. The, they reach back to Baedeker, uh, the original travel guides, mass-produced travel guides with these red things that you see in the picture. Um, Baedeker was really for elite families, the children of, of the, the, the 20-something children of rich families who would take a tour of uh, the museums of Italy and Spain and so on and see the sites. And, as a kind of finishing off, cultural finishing off. Uh, so, I mean, this still exists effectively. Uh, Baedeker still exists. So, um, but these these are branded red handbooks that you would carry around, and uh, they would guide you to see the right things, right? Like any travel guide, see the right things. So. When Malcolm Quick says anthropologists are like tourists, what he has in mind is that anthropologists go and like tourists they want to consume culture and they see what they expected to see in a way but of course they expected different things slightly because the anthropologists have been reading not travel guides but other monographs other works by anthropologists but they arrive and then all right they don't get caught up in staying in a hotel and and going to see the the Taj Mahal or the sites of uh, they probably go to the museums but the, the, they don't necessarily go to see the same sites the tourists go to um but they still and, and they don't get taken on a guided tour by a travel guide but they do still have guides think of levi strauss arriving and the kids uh, or, or even the chief guiding him through the um amazon forest to, the, to meet the namaquara or um Oh, Evans Pritchard and the leopard skin chief telling him about cows and culture. They 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 are perhaps caught by a more sophisticated kind of travel guide, um, but nonetheless a travel guide. So Crick's barb was that you know anthropology is a kind of finishing school for 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 scholarship in a way that you go off and do your field work. It's it's like the extended tour. Of course, there are other kinds of guides, not just Baudica and, and um, Lonely Planet. There's inside guides. I particularly like the one for Calcutta, which starts off by saying, everything you've ever heard about Calcutta is true. Everything. Um, so, of course, people have heard a lot of crap about Calcutta. <laughs> um, I guess in the 70s and 80s, when I was doing my field work, 80s, 90s, um, end of the 80s, Calcutta wasn't as maybe had a different reputation than it does now. If I asked you about Calcutta, what would you say? Anyone? Like, what do you think the character of Calcutta would be? So, what have you heard about the place? Calcutta in India, or well, just India? Anyone? Of 
45 of you, no one got a view? Impressions of? Without thinking about it, just yeah, what words might you associate with Calcutta? Without looking it up, I mean, maybe we could do that. What does TripAdvisor say about Calcutta? That might be a good example. TripAdvisor, Calcutta. All right. It's not that easy to get on. There is an internet issue today. Come on, official site. My internet is not working. It's very disturbing. So am I talking to anyone at all? Is anyone out there? I can see movement on cameras. Han, I can see your camera just gone off. Is anyone here in this? Hello. Folks, please. You've got three bars, so it should be heard. All right, I don't know what's wrong with this. And let everyone send messages and one. So TripAdvisor tells that Calcutta is a place that has lots of festivals. That's good. Better than it used to. So you can hear one person. Come on, there's 45 of you. I want 45 answers. Snap, snap. Uh, my internet is really super slow. So, One person has responded and dock everyone a, a score from their uh, assignment. Um, so anyway, in those in the, the 80s, I guess the image of Calcutta was something like, uh, thank you, T. Very crowded, lots of noise, temples and polluted, yeah. And, and people might have referred in the 80s to Mother Teresa, um, crowds and poverty, right? The, 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 the city had a pretty bad reputation. I mean, 100 years ago, the city was the city of palaces, described by Rudyard Kipling. And it was the, 150 years ago, 120 years ago, it was the city of palaces, the, the, the jewel in the, in the crown, so to speak, uh, uh, the center of the empire. Um, and and some of the buildings are still very impressive and it's one of the richest cities in india um, but yes there are also poor people but of course the filmmakers that visited westerners that made films like louis marl um reinhard half made a better film but louis marl uh, they they focus on usually the photogenic poverty of the city right in the same way, the anthropologists come looking for kinship and and um, mythology and and the shamans and and uh, you know, rituals. Uh, they have a certain focus, things that they're looking to see, so they find them. Tourists also come looking to see what they expect to see. So they've heard things about the city and they come and they find that. 
you go to the market, you pick out and photograph the or the, or the railway station, photograph the people sleeping on the street or, or the crowds or, or something like that. Um, it takes a while after you're sitting there for a long time, you start to see that there's actually a lot else that's going on in the city and the city has uh, much more going on in terms of literature, theatre, film festivals. There's a film festival right now on in Calcutta that I'm the, on the jury for, bizarrely. Um, of course, that part of my job is online. I wish I could visit. Um, TripAdvisor gives us 10 places to, to visit Calcutta. Um, walk, see, walk to, a trip to Shanti Nikitan, which is not even in Calcutta. Uh, Raj Heritage Walk, Magic Hour Tour, a food tour, a food walk, a night walk, the Victoria Memorial Hall, the Mother House, and the Temple. Yeah, Park Street, Eco Tourism Park. Okay, so it's a bit better than the old stereotypes. But anyway, back in the day, word used to go by word of mouth about a place to visit, and that's what Lonely Planet cashed in on. But but Bartica and Insight Guides, they're they're basically printed versions of what other people have said of impressions. And isn't that what anthropologists do? write down their impressions after staring at people and yeah. and nowadays that's what TripAdvisor is and TripAdvisor is somehow sort of more democratic and anyone can write it rather than the people that Tony Wheeler and Maureen Wheeler hire to work for Lonely Planet like um, well they can be really good people the novelist Michelle de Cressa used to, used to uh, write for Lonely Planet um, I'm sure she's not the only one, but she's certainly the greatest of, of authors who, to have gone through their stable. Uh, I don't know what books she did. I think her, her job was, was also probably editing. But uh, nowadays, yeah, anyone can write on TripAdvisor. I mean, as long as you stick within the guidelines of the algorithm and don't say anything that's true. Uh, sorry, that's, that's rude. Same thing. Um, yeah. And, and, oh, yeah, Lonely Planet's translated and, and um, uh, the, the backpackers uh, of, of India use it as well as the well-to-do. So it has it caters for uh, several different class of tourist or tourist and traveller. That distinction is almost as important as the difference between urban anthropologist, social anthropologist, uh, physical anthropologist, anthropologist of language, anthropologist of the rural, you know, there, there are so many different kinds of tourists, so you can't really say anthropologists are like tourists because what kind of anthropologists are like what kind of tourists? But, I mean, there are some, especially like Koreans and Japanese who go to India who are just going to have a break from kind of controlled society and smoke some hashish. And there are, there are tourists who go for five-star comfort and, and so on. There are tourists who favour cultural performances. We saw them arriving on the island in the Trebranders when we were looking at Malinovsky, uh, looking for traditional dances and so on, even though those traditional dances are put on as performances for tourists. And they, there are some tourists that go to India to find themselves. Like, were you lost? If you're lost, you're not going to find yourself in India. It's too big a place. It's the size of Europe and so on. And there are others that go and, and just want to have cheap break from the expenses of living in Europe or, or Australia or wherever um, and, and go for conviviality and, and atmosphere of hanging out with people the same age and, and, and uh, away from the parents and uh, able to drink and drug as much as they like and uh, lose weight and look like crap and buy some cheap souvenirs to send home and uh, have an accident on a motorcycle. Um, the backpacker experience of replicating a little bit of, of the comforts of home in a certain street in every city, like every city in Asia seems to have a street for backpackers, District 1 near the bus station uh, for Ho Chi Minh City, although of course these were massively affected and, and destroyed basically by uh, COVID. I walked around there just this week to have a look because a lot of the places that used to serve uh, international travellers from the, the bars down to the budget hotels uh, have been repackaged as something else now, partly because domestic tourists, the, uh, the Vietnamese who need to visit Vietnam, Nui Viet, the Du Lic, the Vietnam, 
I can't remember the exact phrase, but great phrase, uh, isn't, isn't as big a number uh, as uh, to cover the absence of 7 million Western tourists coming into the country per year. Uh, and nor do they want to stay in the kind of budget places. These are some photos, I think they're of Dalat, um, a budget hotel in Dalat. I mean, who? this is not what you see on the tourist brochure, is it? The tourist brochure looks uh, something much different, right? The, I mean, this is more like the tourist brochure thing, right? Um, there's backpackers. Yeah. But uh, 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 Well, I guess, yeah, the, the publications and the budget places affected by COVID and every city having one, uh, 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 and, and of course there are five-star hotels and, and the budget hotels have been hurt as well, not only by COVID, uh, but also before that, um, um, in India anyway, in Calcutta, certainly, uh, the, the budget hotel area is still there, Sutter Street. Um, it used to be a famous street where Tagore lived, but it was really a city. It became the red light area as well. Uh, it's kind of now a bit run down because not all tourists go there because of um, Airbnb being a much better option and uh, homestays and things like that, which has probably happened here as well. I mean, it's not an area of research, but I, I wouldn't doubt that, that Airbnbs made its way uh, into the, the, the District 1 tourist area and, and change that. And people come out and live in District 7 and get a much better deal and, and meet different kinds of people. But the point of that is, and the point of Crick writing about uh, anthropologists and tourists was, and I don't know if this was his point, but, but the effect of that is, is to emphasize that uh, both are a kind of industry and, and anthropology as such is a, is a kind of industry as well. It's in the business of producing books about people and has a whole infrastructure. And, and that kind of release mocking the, the individual anthropologists saying you're just like a tourist has the effect for me of reminding us that it's never just a tourist that comes. It's a whole range of different jobs that, are, uh, that surround that tourist. Remember our backpacker, right? It's not just the backpacker on the tour. It's all the services that are, are, are jobs, basically the infrastructure that, that surrounds travel. Everything from the airlines and all the people they employ getting people into country to transport workers to um, the people who make those little wallets that go around your waist uh, to the people who work in the Lakshmi Lodge uh, tea makers and, and tea boys usually, the tea wallahs, uh, often backpackers that I noticed uh, when I was doing my field work would sit around having conversations about how terrible uh, child labor was in Asia or something because they'd seen some agricultural work where some, some children in a village were, were, were working in the field while being served by underage kids doing uh, running around uh, a restaurant delivering their cups of tea from 6 a.m. in the morning till 12 p.m. at night and sleeping on the premises, not even noticing that that was also child. Anyway, by the by, um, you know, even the hashish delivery, uh, the, the, the illegal economy is a part of, of uh, tourism and of anthropology. It has the point of showing us that anthropology doesn't happen with just the anthropologists going, right? They go by transport. They they have people carrying their bags. The whole passport industry, let alone what happens to their product after after they they write the book, it gets edited. There's the whole publishing house and all the people employed by by that. Then the bookshop, um, people binding the book together and people selling the book, and then uh, the book going into the library. So librarians and then classes coming in and reading the book, uh, footnotes, references, conferences that promote the book, um, uh, a whole, whole employed academics to teach it. And, and, you know, it's a massive, massive industry. And it punctures the idea of uh, what our anthropologists do. They don't just go like Malinowski and be a field worker. They are part of a, a whole economy. Many, many people are involved. 
and yes, there's one, the heroic intrepid field worker, but uh, it's a bit like a, a film, the film made by Martin Scorsese or something. Hundreds of people work on that film to make the film happen, right? Yeah, it's attached to a name and so also with anthropology. Hundreds of people work to make it possible for there to be uh, or, or anything, any part of the tourism industry too. This beautiful sunset of the Taj Mahal over the, the river where you can't actually... Um, yeah, you, 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 it, it took a lot of people to produce this, this even. The people who worked for Kodak, the people who made the, the postcard, the, the, the lens grinders, the, um, you know, it reminds us that there's a whole um, industry around culture. Right? And Crick's essay for that is fantastic. Even though he goes in the other direction and says we need to play and we need to uh, look at the quizzical, the curious, the, the strange, and, and, and he's, he's about being mischievous, the, the other effect of that is to remind us that this idea of the learning, the knowledge production is not uh, the work of a, a single heroic individual. Right? It's always always uh, uh, a social, socially produced thing. And this makes it important to think about ethnography or anthropology as um, definitely a political practice, right? And, and, and we've been stressing this for a few weeks, but now I want to get into it uh, to, to talk about um, social movements much more. We started to talk about one, the anti-war activity of the, the, that led to the ethics guidance last two weeks ago, um, last time. And, and so now some other um, movements. Right? Um, since Malinowski, right? Uh, uh, there's the social movements of the 60s, actually the anti-war movement, Vietnam War, and but also uh, um, civil rights and feminism and, and and so on were part of that internal reflexivity, that questioning of what it is that anthropologists are doing. And then also uh, uh, they're kind of uh, an effect of an industrial s dispute within the culture industry. So ethnography as, as political practice, we need to talk about this anthropologist as someone involved in political movements as well. And sometimes, and what's new about some of the situations where we're in for anthropologists more recently, sometimes anthropologists are explicitly advocates of a people and they're embedded, like the army had journalists embedded with them, they're embedded within political movements, whether it be um, David Graeber in, in Rojava, right? and I'm gonna talk about David Graeber today, or Kathleen Goff and uh, the anti-war movement in the 70s. David Graeber though, who I want to talk about, I was showing you a little bit of his stuff before we started today, is an anthropologist who unfortunately died a year and a bit ago um, of COVID. And uh, um, yeah, very sad. I used to work with him. Um, we didn't always get on, but we did sometimes. And he's a really great, thinker and, and does so many interesting things. Um, it was sometimes more difficult one-to-one, -one, but yeah, that could be um, because anarchists are like that. But anyway, um, he is an example of, of someone that has made anthropology work even after the heroic field worker uh, has been questioned, right? That uh, and, and even after the, the idea of, of anthropology is kind of unraveled a little bit. I mean, he does have a link to the 60s and 70s time because uh, one of his close associates or even teacher, I'm not sure, uh, but someone he certainly wrote with was Marshall Salins. And Salins is credited, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but is credited with, with creating the, the, the teaching. All right, and, and I want to say that teaching is like a sit-in, right? But but, but uh, very much a new kind of political strategy that belonged to the protest movements of the 60s and 70s, which returned again in the 90s uh, with the anti-globalization. Well, 
the mid 90s with the anti-criminal justice act protests in in britain some other protests against globalization in europe uh, but then uh, really kicking off um, with geneva uh, genoa Gen in stockholm uh, and then uh, in, 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 in America. Uh, Anti-globalization, it, it was stalled a little bit after 2011, uh, 2001, sorry, 9-11, um, but then USA, USA, but then the anti-war movement sort of took up that, that space. That also stalled a bit over time. Um, and then became by, by, by 2010, uh, uh, um, movement of the squares, you could call it, or you could call it Arab Spring, or something. There was an Arab Spring protest in Tunisia and 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 um, um, Egypt. We'll talk about them in a minute. Uh, coincided with with student unrest in the UK because after years and years and years of of, of the slow but inevitable transformation of the university into a business students finally uh really kicked off in 2010 in england um and anthropology was linked with that uh, david and i were at the protest the first one talking about exactly these issues um basically what had happened is from the from the 60s onwards 70s onwards uh, university provision was expanding uh perhaps only a small percentage, 10, 15, 20 percent of people used to go to university. It expanded in the 60s with red brick buildings, 70s red brick buildings. But by the 80s and 90s, when 90s the Labor Party were aiming for 50 percent of young people to all go straight to university um, or above that. In some countries, Taiwan, I know, 90 percent is, is not unusual. And uh, this, this is a worldwide phenomenon and it meant an expansion of universities and it meant Actually, universities seeing that expansion as uh, economically interested. Think of RMIT University, which is uh, a smallish university in, in Australia, having a campus here on, in, in Vietnam, Why? Or, or Fulbright, or um, Nagoya University from Japan has a campus in Hanoi. Uh, Greenwich from London is, is, is in Ho Chi Minh City too, a small-ish one, but yeah. or Monash University in Malaysia or um, Nottingham University in China and Nanjing or Yale University in Singapore. So, I mean, the, the, the proliferation of private universities as well. And it was all part of this. And, and the, the change from the days when uh, the elite of third world or southern countries was invited to come to Australia or England to have a free education, or in fact were paid to come for education as, as foreign aid, as a gift, transformed to charging those uh, children of the well-to-do in the cities of the global south to pay high fees to come and study overseas and get the degrees that they want. Their parents want them, of course, upwardly mobile and so on. Um, and, and still the case, except for this year, last two years, because of COVID, uh, a lot of people from Vietnam went to do higher degrees overseas and paid a lot of money for the fees. Huge. Got into debt. Uh, and so, on. So, so the debts are what really uh, affected the students. They saw education being turned even more and more into an export for dollars thing, cutbacks on teaching levels, uh, quality of education going down, costs going up. Uh, and, and protest in 2010, but it coincided with uh, the Arab sting, spring sting, well, depending on which side, what, what you think of it, um, and uh, which started in Tunisia, but happened in Egypt, as well as Gezi Park, eventually in, in Turkey and uh, a number of other places, and, and led uh, later in um, 2011 to Occupy, which, David again was was involved in. He'd already been involved in the anti-globalization movement and written a, a quite great book that we'll read some of later, uh, called Direct Action, uh, an ethnography of the the anti-globalization movement. And he was there at the beginning with Occupy when when Adbusters called for a um, a sit-in, basically the old school 
kind of protest, a sit-in at Wall Street, to try and just sit there and stop Wall Street from doing its regular business. I know it's the idea. And of course, they were surrounded by the police eventually, and they, the electricity was cut off. So they invented new strategies for protest, like um, the human megaphone, someone speaking, but can't be heard by the people 20 or 30 deep. So the people surrounding the speaker would then repeat what the speaker said. So then, then the, those people a bit further out heard it, and then they would repeat it and say to the people even further out, who said it again to the people at their very edge. So everyone heard what was being said. And in fact, everyone said what was being said, which is interesting because that's somehow not more democratic, but it's certainly more participatory. There's still someone in the middle speaking, although they had strategies for that as well, an open mic. Uh, anyone could, could get the mic and speak, but you had to be obviously confident to speak. Uh, they had progressive speaking lists, of course, to you know, put women first and, and, and so on. Uh, anyone who hadn't spoken before was allowed to speak before someone else, so there's no one dominating. They had little, um, uh, a series of coded ways of, of uh, moving the debate along or discussion along. You, you agree, you waved your hands, jazz hands they were called. I'm a bit more skeptical of some of these things, but but they were all um, important parts of uh, trying to facilitate participatory decision making, and and in this movement, right? No, that was interesting, and Graeber was was writing about that. Of course, he was also writing his his more conventional uh, ethnography, which also uh, came out. He worked in in Gibraltar, sorry, not Gibraltar, Madagascar. Um, I don't know why I'm thinking about my grandfather in, in Gibraltar, uh, Madagascar, and he wrote there and, and speaks very interestingly, more interestingly, I think sometimes about that. And he wrote this huge book at the time was was super famous breakthrough book for him called Debt. Um, so this happened at the same time that that uh, uh, people were reflecting on what anthropology could do. And Graeber took on anthropology, or took on this, this, took anthropology to this new place in a way by taking on this subject and taking on 5,000 years of history of debt. And going back to um, Sumer and, and, and Mesopotamia uh, and, and so on to talk about, um, well, someone unkindly said it was 5,000 years of anecdotes because he did it in such an anthropological style, but that, that's, that's okay. Um, in a way, that's possible because the anthropologists doing conventional fieldwork, monograph anthropology had had gone away. As uh, oh, I'm still there, but it hadn't been wasn't the only thing anthropologists did, and and uh, the reflexivity forced upon them by changes in the political climate and the development of anthropology departments in other countries, in Japan, India, Thailand, Mexico, doing the ethnography. They're in conventional ethnography. That's part of their scam, actually. Look, at the very moment that uh, uh, anthropology departments are set up all over the world and anthropology departments exist in, in Mexico or Thailand or so on, that's the moment where anthropology says, oh, no, no, <laughs> ethically, you can't do this anymore, or, um, or um, the monograph is kind of over. Irony of ironies, but nonetheless. Uh, but, well, at the same time, that um, anthropology is being reflexive, David was able to, to shift the focus, I suppose, of the discipline onto this, this thing debt was important because what was happening globally was the anti-globalization movement was, it was about that because really the problem there is the IMF and the World Bank putting all these countries where anthropologists used to work into debt relationships. Uh, with foreign trade, right, and and with with uh, uh, in order to comply with the World Bank dictate and and be bailed out of uh, economic distress that caused by whatever economic mismanagement by the post-colonial elite. Let's not get into that. Um, there was also alongside the anti-globalization movement a debt forgiveness um, campaign, and I guess the position really is, um, you know. <sighs> Should the debts be um, just cleared, 
um, because that's how elite debt has always been, uh, you know, it's always been negotiable. Um, or actually, should they be abolished? The debt system should be abolished because if you if you uh, just like remove the debts of the, the third world, that just opens a space. The global south opens a space for them to get back into debt because there are opportunist banks as well as uh, opportunist figures who would would love that system to continue because it it pays off. Anyway, uh, this sixties legacy, sixties seventies legacy returned in the. Um, the, this moment of, of movement to the transformation towards the movements. I mean, it's the, the stuff I was talking about two weeks ago, right? Um, um, it started in Vietnam, uh, it was about controversies, um, but it started with, with civil rights and, and the uh, uh, bulletin concerned Asian scholars, the teachings, Michigan, um, Marshall Silence, and, and, and so on. Um, and, and that U.S. Army um, manual that I was talking about. Right? So it's no coincidence that the very time anthropology was beginning this crisis of representation, uh, which made it problematic to go into the field, that uh, and, and indigenous anthropologists were going into the field, no contradiction, uh, at that same time the focus of anthropology turned into look at what it is that anthropologists do, what is it we're teaching, what's happening in the classroom, what's the power structure there, what's the hierarchy and flipped classrooms where the students set the curriculum and so on. There all these challenges to the authority of the, of the teacher were, 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 were in place, right? That they didn't disrupt the power hierarchy is, is no surprise, but there was a kind of backlash against it. In the 80s and 90s, that backlash took the form of, um, you know, trying to contain the the movement of the squares, the of the criminal justice movement, reclaim the streets, uh, the Zapatistas, um, Chavez. Uh, uh, all through the 90s, there was a battle going on um, that led to, I, I suppose, the movement of the squares. Battle over an alternative, another alter, an alternative world is possible and a, uh, the more conservative, um, commercially driven agenda. And Occupy was, was a, a focus on that, right? Um, it, it was trying to challenge, again, World Bank, World Trade, and, and, and it was speaking, the problem was it spoke on, but it was speaking on behalf of the, the rest of the world other than the oligarchy the IMF, World Bank, and the post-colonial elites. So it was the 99%, right? But here's the trick. It was, um, and the slogan 99%, is, is, there is some, some, some connection to Graeber in, in that. He helped come up with it. Um, there, there's a problem in a bunch of middle-class protesting students speaking on behalf of 99% of the world, that's just not um, representative of democracy, right? But their, their intention and, and their ethos was, was there was to side with the people against um, the mass. And, and in these sit-ins, Occupy basically is a sit-in. It's, it's 60s politics, but updated for the year 2010. Um, I mean, they updated the tent as well of Malinowski to the be in the squares, the tent university, where David and I and others would sit and give classes uh, inside the occupation and and um, uh, the, the university that had become a corporate model looking at, at, at money was open to everyone. So anyone could come to lectures uh, and, and okay, and those lectures were about the culture industry and, and, and mass hypnotism of the culture industry and the question of resistance against the culture industry and its fascism um, and, and all sorts of experimental policies about, you know, experiments about uh, how you might think this other world possible. 
exchanging performances, storytelling, events with uh, situations and games and, and play, the ludic um, gift exchange, conviviality as a, as a, as a culture. This is David talking at, at one of the Occupy events. Um, and of course, these things can be recuperated and, and, and I mean, the very fact of, of the publishing industry producing a book called Occupy or the Democracy Project and uh, making its money out of, of uh, anthropology text about the thing that is opposed to making money out of, yeah, is uh, one of the recuperative contradictions of contemporary capital. But, you know, at least here you see the smirk of or the possibility of anthropology being done differently. And in, in direct action, Graeber's using an old ethnographic approach, but he's doing something uh, that, that transforms anthropology, you know, so that uh, we, we kind of can think that despite all of the continuities with the lone heroic field worker and the contradictions, uh, there's still another kind of research possible. In, in what he, he's, he's doing. It's just a, a tragedy that he died at 59. And um, all right, he's got a new book out just now, which is weird because he's dead, but uh, no, no. Um, it's a history of the world you know, since the beginning. But that's uh, another example of, of you know, the, the uh, expansive scope of, of what's, what he, he was capable of doing. So that's pretty impressive. And uh, wow. Well, yeah, much missed. David Grabo. Um, I'll stop there.